Good day. Today we're going to talk to Dr. Juliet Kamwendo, a lecturer in, and a researcher in the Department of Gender and African Studies. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you very much for having me here. And Doctor, can you share with us how did you become a researcher? Uh, let me start from the beginning. Uh, I was born in Malawi, raised in Malawi, did my education in Malawi up to diploma level when I did my teacher training. And I have taught from primary, high school, and here I am today. So, to answer your question, this whole thing of being a researcher started a long time ago when I was just teaching at a primary school. Uh, that was the time when I was given a class which was uh, a bit challenging. It is uh, a class which is similar to grade 8 here in South Africa. But uh, according to Malawi context, in that class, students are supposed to write examination and they are to be selected to go to high school, which is uh, maybe a bit different from here in South Africa because at grade 8, after I pass, they just all go to high school. But in Malawi, they have to write an examination and they have to be selected. So that class is a bit challenging to teach us. And by that time, I was teaching that class English and Science, while my colleague was teaching mathematics. So I got that interest to see how the girls are doing in mathematics and science because Every time they write their examination, I mean their test, you find that girls are always going back with their maths, which was a bit worrying to me as a teacher, because now I was looking at the end of the year that they have to pass all the subjects. So maybe I can say that's where the interest of being a researcher came in, that I conducted what we call action research during that time to find out what is the problem with the girls. So I conducted that research within the urban areas in which I was teaching, and the, that paper was funded by University of Malawi. I went to Mbabane, University of Switzerland, to present it uh, at a conference. So that was the starting of my research journey. It started from there before I even got a degree, but I had that in my mind. Thank you for sharing with us. And then, Doctor, what are you currently working on? Uh, as now a gender scholar, because now at my master's level, I did gender studies, master's in gender studies. Uh, currently, I can say, Anything that concerns women and girls is the area of research that I look at. But I conduct my research in an interdisciplinary way. I also pull other areas to find out what are the challenges that are there for women and girls. As I have already explained that I come from a background of a teacher. It's always my concern to see maybe how women are faring in the areas of education, how women are, how girls are also faring in that area, and even how they ascend to public, I mean, the public sphere now, because coming from the private sphere as women and girls now, how they, they ascend to the public sphere, which is maybe working institutions and all that. So, basically, my research is within the area of women and girls. And uh, I am expanding it now to understand the issues of gender-based violence because as you know that in South Africa, that is uh, another challenge which has been called a pandemic now. Yeah. So right now I'm involved in research in GBV in South Africa to understand what he, what is happening and wh what can we do in order to mitigate the situation that is confronting us. Yeah, so 
um, in a program which was launched by the European Union in a conjunction with the lawyers of human rights. They are based in Johannesburg, but they normally come here. They launched a program called Masipandisane out in the outskirts of Room uh, 10. So I'm um, in that, and that is the focus that I have right now. And I'm also writing another proposal right now that maybe focusing on women only maybe is not helping us. Maybe if we can expand to understand also from the men and also the youth, especially the boys, because it will seem as if we have neglected the other part. Even if the government comes in with different interventions, we see that the more they, the more they bring those interventions, the more GPV is going up. The numbers are escalating, and even it will fatal incidents like femicide also. Yeah, so that is the area that is of my 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 focus. But I can say, as a gender scholar, I'm not limited only to that. I can also touch on anything that comes my way that I see that because it's not all about gender, it's not all about women and girls. It also concerns other marginalized groups like the LGBTIQ+, and the other binaries. So anything that comes in along that way as a gender scholar is my area of research. Okay, thank you for sharing with us. And then, Doctor, what does gender mean in Africa? Gender is, uh, we look at it as just uh, the relationship that uh, occurs in our society between maybe different genders, men and women, the relationship. It's not something that one was born with. It is a socially constructed something. We are born as one, but due to society, it constructs us to believe on other things that maybe in other contexts they don't believe in. So gender is a socially constructed phenomenon that only entails relationship that exists within our society. Okay, thank, sure. you. thank you. And then coming back to your work, what influenced your writing? From which uh, perspective or a school of thought that influenced your writing? Okay. Maybe if you can... <laughs> I'm influenced by the issues of gender that I see in my society. Maybe I can say from cultural perspective. That is the thing that influences me. Because even when I was doing my PhD, that was the area of focus. So, as I said, that gender is a socially constructed phenomenon. I believe that wherever we come from, that's where we, we construct whatever we believe in. So, if I may answer it, I don't know whether I have answered it according to what we wanted, but that is what influences me to look at where we are coming from as people, because that is where the starting point is. Socialization, that's the main thing. So that's what influences me. Yes. Thank you, Doctor. And then, are there any exciting gaps within your study area? Exciting gaps? Yes. Yes, there are so many exciting gaps, because see, if we go back where maybe the whole thing was initiated from nine, like from 1995, from the Beijing platform, the project which was started during that time was to, I mean, bring equality between men and women. Because people believed that women have been marginalized. So the gaps are just the, if we look at everywhere that we deal with our life, whether at work, we go in our homes, as I said, in politics, in business, you see that if you look at the way things are going, 
Of course, we have made some strides towards that, but there are still gaps which are there. For example, if we look at decision making, who occupy those spaces most? You see that in most cases they are men. Of course, women are there. In politics, if you go to politics, you see that that space is occupied by mostly men. Women find it difficult to go there. Of course, there are few women who try as much as possible to break into that, but it's an area that is being difficult for women to penetrate. And if you go to science and technology, if, even if we can just go to engineering school right now, you find that most of the, the, the students who are there, they are males as compared to females. So we have made progress since 1995, but the progress is slow. So the gap is, what is making it, what is making this progress so slow? So those are the areas, those are the gaps that he, as he, researchers, we need to go in and find out what is happening. Why are we not having women in poly, many women in politics? Because we need more women who can also pose as role models to our girls. If we don't have w women in those spaces which are deemed male to men, that means everyone will have in mind that it, this is a space for me only. Is it that what we want as a society? When are we going to close this gap? Because the aim here is to close the gap. Whether at schooling, at workplaces, are the structures allowing more women to come in? So these are some of the exciting gaps which are there as researchers, not only those in gender, but even you in the library, whenever you are recruiting the people, the, the, you are hiring people, you must consider that. Even if the uh, what, Employment Act is there, you see that there is a bit of resistance. Still, there are other spaces which are protected for males. And here in South Africa, there are exciting gaps when it comes to the color of the skin. Who get the opportunities here in South Africa? Most opportunities. If I go to an interview today with a, a, someone with, with a, a white skin, who is going to be hired? So those are the exciting gaps that we should go and look into and research using Africanized methodologies, not Eurocentric. Because if we keep on using Eurocentric methodologies, we won't go to the I mean, what? What can I do? Root cause of what is happening? Because people believe that we are in Africa. We can only close this gap if we use Afrocentric methodologies in research. So that is also another exciting area that I'm interested in. Because as I said, my PhD, I put the language, the gender, and the indigenous knowledge system together. It was an interdisciplinary. So those are the areas that I look around and I do research. That is my niche. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And then coming to sustainable development goal number five, it talks about gender equality. Are there any mechanism or strategies that are in place to achieve that? Yeah, of course, there are so many mechanisms that have been put in place. Yes, goal number five talks about gender equality and women empowerment. So, the question that we should ask ourselves today is, of course, many of the governments signed so many declarations after the Benjamin 1995, there are so many declarations that he, the countries signed the Maputo Declaration, Nairobi Declaration, and even the Sadiq Protocol, which he aimed to, to at least to have 50 50, but is there any 50 50 today? So if you ask about the mechanisms, are there? but the resistance is just too big. 
the issue of patriarchy is so hard to break, to crack. We go back, as I said, to our socialization, where we are socialized that men are the leaders. Isn't that what we are taught? Parents, as we bring up our children, I mean girls and boys, in our homes, subconsciously that's what we tell them, that these are your leaders. Even by naming them that this one is a cause, this one is a what, you name them according to what you believe in. So it is those things that are making those mechanisms which are there. Benjamin platform for action is the major mechanism. A blueprint which was there, was put there so that the gender equality is maintained. By now we could have been talking of something else, but the patriarchal is hard to crack and it, it, the structures are so resistant that we are failing to achieve that 50-50 gender equality. But we have all the hopes that, as I said, we have made so many strides. Today you can see that there are women who are also presidents, isn't it? In Tanzania there's a woman president. And uh, previously in Malawi we had a, a woman president. But you look around what is happening if a woman is, is in that position. What happens? There's no support to the end that at the end the woman is relegated and deemed to be a failure. Not that she's a failure, but there's no support. When a man is there, all the support is given. Even if they have done so, I mean, scandals or what, but many they will protect them. But when it's a woman, it's always on top of the world that we knew that a woman cannot handle this position. So to me, I take patriarchal structure to be the main resistance of not achieving what we could have achieved by now. But mechanisms are there. Even here at institution, if you look at the policy, it says something, but in actual fact, maybe people do the other thing. They might not say it, but structurally you see that women are failing to penetrate. Currently, there's an initiative that has been launched by Professor Masoha about women in research. It has been launched two weeks ago. I attended there at Equitas. The aim is to promote women research, but listening to what the presenters who spoke on that day, it will seem as if this thing, maybe it has already failed because people are talking about we are failing to do this, we are failing to publish as women, we are failing to do research as women because we are not provided this and this structure. You see that women are not getting what they are, because we differ. I am a woman, I am a mother, you are a man, you are a father of course, but the role that mothers play is different from what you do. Yes. You can go home and tell everyone that I want to wake and sit, you wake. But a woman cannot do the same. A mother cannot do the same. There are a number of things that you have to put in place as a, as a woman, as a mother. So, are structures allowing women, putting that in consideration that these are women? Of course, we are not saying that they should just be carried and get promotion or that. But at least the structures should allow women to operate. So, to answer the question that are there mechanisms, yes, they are there. Internationally, continentally, regionally, I've mentioned them. But the patriarchal resistance and the attitudes, they are the ones which are making these mechanisms not to work. As a result, we look as if we are just stepping on one place. But we have achieved and we aim to, and we are still going to do that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Doctor. And then it's a big challenge for us to make an introspection as men. Yes. It's true. Please, like the issue of GBV. Even if the, the initiatives are there by government or whatever acts are there, but what happens within the house is totally different. So, our attitudes should change. 
these power relations that we are holding on, that I'm a man, nothing can touch me. I think th these are the ones which are making everything to fail. The government is wasting a lot of money doing all those things. But what happens within the house is out of reach to the government. It only takes the people who live in that house. It only takes the men to change their attitudes. If I say I want to wait till this hour, till nine o'clock, I'm publishing something, my husband should not get worried because I do the same. I respect him when he's working like that. Why should it be different when I want to wake? By the end of everything, the year goes without even publishing anything. Because if I go home, I find my husband very angry. Where were you? But when he comes home late from work, I welcome him, you see. Those are the society attitudes, the cultural attitudes that we are talking about. So, we are looking at men to help us especially the issue of HDV. We are pleading with them. That's why I said I'm writing this proposal. We just wanted to go out there to, to engage the men and ask them what can we do, and also the youth, because from where I come from, there is a proverb which says if you wanted to straighten a tree, you cannot straighten it when it is already old. You start when it is small like this. You can build something to make it straight. Yes. So maybe if we begin, maybe in your case, you have already formed your mind that whatever Dr. Kamwendo is saying is nothing to me when I go home. This is what I expect my wife to do, isn't it? But let's start with the young ones who are growing. Maybe they have, they will have a different mindset, yes. looking at a woman, respecting a woman. Because gender issues are issues of human rights. Everyone should enjoy the world. That's true. <laughs> Thanks, Doctor. And then coming to technology, artificial intelligence, what role can it play in gender and African studies? Yeah, there's a lot that uh, we learn from technology. If women, more women are, are able to do that, they, are, they can access information. Because for a woman to know her rights, a girl to know her rights, you need to, to, to have that information. Without that information, someone can just exploit you. So technology is also another area that you, we are trying hard for women to, to go in. Because if they know how to operate technology, it will also assist them to get information and also break into those, what we call male domain. Yes. So, like, as I said, that I'm coming from an angle of a teacher. Teachers should not uh, discourage girls who wants to go into there. Because we need more girls to, to you know, into technology also. Because the, if you look at uh, economically, those are the areas which are better than the other areas. Traditionally, we just thought that a woman should be a teacher, a woman should be a nurse. But you look at the, 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 the salary that they get from there, it's different from those who are doing technology. So in gender, we believe that, especially on issues of GDV, if a woman at least is able to support herself, maybe she can get away from these very abusive relationships that they cling on, because they cannot afford it to, to support themselves or to support the children. So the more they go into that technology, the also the better. But the major thing is about getting information about their own rights. A woman should know her rights. A girl should know her rights. If she's exploited, she must know that, no, this is exploitation. But without that knowledge, we believe that knowledge is power. If you don't have knowledge, Everything goes for you. Thank you, Doctor. And then, what message can you give to aspiring researchers? Oh, okay. Researchers, like in gender or just in general, 
should I say in general or in gender? Because yes. in gender, I have already said that we need to look at those areas which are like there are gaps now, and we need to use methodologies which are Africanized, not Eurocentric. But if you look at the just researchers in general, because gender is a cross-cutting, I mean, a discipline. Yes. It is almost, in almost every discipline, there's gender that you can pick. So we urge researchers also to look at into that thing. Not only leave it for Center for Gender and Africa Studies, but every discipline, the researchers there, should make sure that they, they look at every, whenever they see something that they know that this one, we need to get answers, even if they are not in gender. So to me, I encourage colleagues from other disciplines to take seriously the issue of gender and research, as I did when I was at, just at primary school, I did my action research, looking into why, that time I didn't know that I'm a researcher, but I was only doing it. So everyone is a researcher. Even a young child at home is a researcher. That's why they are so curious to, to see what is happening around them. They are researching. They are trying to find the truth about that. So other researchers, they must also engage, though they are not in gender, but the gender is a cross-cutting. They need to pick what is happening in their display. Those in mathematics, if they see that, why is the class dominated by males only? Where are the girls? They can do a research and find out what is happening. Every time we walk, you are a researcher, you must point, um, you pick something. I always pass through get, get five from where I stay. I pass through health sciences here. Whenever I am passing there, I'm doing my research because I always look at it, the issues of gender. Why are there males, more males here? And I look at the issue of race. How many black people are here? So I encourage other researchers also to have that in mind. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Then apart from research, what are your other interests? Like my hobbies? Yes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I because as I said, I did my my schooling, my early school schooling in Malawi, where we did all the subjects, including agriculture. I like doing gardening okay. at home. If you come home during weekend, you will not know that this is Doctor Kamwindo, <laughs> because I'll be putting on my overalls and doing all the gardening, planting my vegetables, whatever, whatever. So that's what I like most. And I used to like teaching agriculture because I have also taught agriculture. So that was also one area that I like. So now uh, I, I do that. Apart from that, because I'm also a church goer, I'm in a choir. I like singing. Okay. Yeah, so those are the two things that keeps me busy when I'm home, if I'm not doing academic work. Thank you. Thanks, Doctor. Then, touching on agriculture, so we need to encourage our communities to build a gardening. Yes. Backyard gardening. You cannot just, because it, you say that the economy is going somewhere now. The money that we are getting is not enough. And it will never be enough. The way we are hearing the economists telling us about the, the world to come. Yes. So, what's wrong for you to buy vegetables and put them around your house or put them in the small pots and put them somewhere you can just pick. That's what I do. I have everything at home. Onions, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's only the winter here which is, I don't like the winter because it's, it's making it hard for the plants to, to some of them they are drying up now. But I like that. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing with us, Dr. Kamendo. We Thank really appreciate your insight and giving us a new perspective on 
gender and African studies. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm honored to be invited to share the little that I know about the issue of gender. Not that I have touched everything, but uh, this is just uh, a glimpse of uh, the issue of gender. There's a lot that uh, we need to understand from gender. Yeah, so thank you very much for inviting me also. I appreciate it a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.